Thank you very much, Elisa. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I uh, thought perhaps we will be just Elisa, myself, and uh, a couple other people here today. It's nice to see you all. So I must say uh, I'm a little bit kind of overwhelmed by the thought that this is our last meeting. I've got grown attached to this and to my monthly trip to <laughs> Borough Park, my monthly schlep from New Jersey. And, um, and um, I, I think at the end I would like to leave a few moments to, to tell you a little bit about uh, how I felt about this group and, and let, uh, let us have a few moments of... Uh, interactive closure. Uh, it feels a little bit strange, perhaps, because of the long break that we had to go back to what we were talking about. And um, uh, what, we were, what I said that I would want to go back to and to uh, continue and to sort of close with were uh, mm -hmm. some points about enhancing, um, you know, intimacy in couples, uh, especially sexuality in uh, long-term couples at this point in life because I have to tell you that, um, as I said when I started this uh, first part of it, studies show beyond doubt that it's a very, very important part of closeness in our uh, marital or long-term uh, relationships and that uh, this becomes in many ways the closeness in the couple becomes more and more important, if, if at all possible, mm -hmm. to say so, in the later part of life. This is where we stopped last time. I'll just quickly run through a couple of things. We said that there are many, many couples in which there's a discrepancy in sexual desire or in, sexual, uh, in, in the wish to be sexually close. And in that case, uh, most of the times, there is really not sufficient interest curiosity about why it is that the other person feels so differently about it. There's a lot of resentment, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of um, uh, bad feelings that are usually expressed in reproaching ways, you know, why don't you, or if I didn't, then we wouldn't, and that, uh, in a very uh, unpleasant way, which begets the same kind of reaction from the other person. But what we actually uh, need is a certain very different curiosity about why the other person feels differently and what might they, might they be going through emotionally so that one can actually bridge over that difference. So, uh, of course, we all know from uh, uh, life, movies, uh, uh, other people's stories that the stereotypical uh, scenario, the more stereotypical scenario, is that the man wants more sex and the woman does not want as much sex or as frequent sex or tries to avoid it. However, uh, I just want to say, because it is very important to mention, while we are all familiar with that stereotypical image, there are also many marriages in which the wife wants a lot more sex than the man, and the man avoids it and doesn't want to give it, withholds it, uh, is anxious about doing it. All kinds of situations where actually the wife would like a lot more and the man is the one who is uh, uh, much less interested. Uh, a good book about those uh, types of marriages, in case you know, you know someone like that or you want to refer them to it, is uh, the book The Sex-Starved Wife by Michelle Weiner Davis, who's a very we reputable counselor. And it's a very hands-on kind of, what do you do if your husband doesn't seem to want to have sex with you and you would like to have more uh, how to proceed. What we know is that in order to have the possibility to actually have a, a satisfying sexual li uh, life, we need a, a cohesive sense of self, as we call it. We need to feel good about ourselves in general. We need to have these different parts of ourselves. You know, as we grow up, we develop very different parts. There is the good girl, there is then all of a sudden the married wife who needs to be also sexual. There is mother of children. There's all kinds of pieces. And if the pieces don't sit very well together, 
then the sense of self is not cohesive, what we call. It's just, it doesn't sit well. So I have, let's say, um, you know, in the, in the um, literature, in world literature, if you like, there is the very well-known sort of distinction between the Madonna and the whore, if you like. There is the, 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 the sexual woman and the very pious or motherly or uh, uh, wife uh, figure. And there is a big tension between these two figures and what's right and how to behave. And to put these two together when we talk about actually a good girl who grows up with the, concept, with the concept of what it means to be a good girl in a certain culture, because it's very, of course, dependent on each culture, but a, a good girl in a very, uh, you know, traditional culture, how does she put together those new aspects of self that all of a sudden uh, are required of her? So I have a couple that I just saw a few times recently, where uh, they're very young, they already have one child, the marriage is in very, very bad shape, but because there is already one child, they're trying to work on it. And uh, the husband had these expectations that uh, once they're married, you know, the wife will be unbelievably uh, sexually active, interested, um, excited. She's a young girl with no experience, very inhibited, uh, she was not at all ready for it, and his approach made it only worse. So now they're in a very bad kind of a situation. I know. What does sex have to do with that? Yes, right. Well, the reason that I chose to actually get there is what I explained in the first part of the meeting, the, the one that took place in May, that there is a very strong and massive connection between sexu good sexuality or problems in sexuality and in intimacy as part of problems in intimacy, but also, also specific problems in couple sexuality as related to a history of trauma of all kinds. And certainly in Holocaust families, there is a relationship between a lot of things that are associated with parental trauma, with all kinds of uh, um, features of the atmosphere in the family, and sexuality in the second generation. So I chose to talk about it because my goal, let me just recapture it here to make it really clear. My goal is to convey that at this point in life, that's where we are, the second generation. Here we are, we're in middle age. We're still young enough to change certain things and make the rest of life better. We are strong enough, wise enough, older, to look at certain things with a different perspective, especially if we stop to think about it. And this series of meetings was about stopping to think about it and encouraging people to really embrace life in all of its possibilities at this point in life, to be a little bit less bound by things that bound us when we were younger, such as, I'll give you an example. I met a survivor this week She's 80 years old. She was a child survivor. So she's both a child survivor and a child of survivors because she survived with her parents. Very unusual and uh, small group of people that survived with the parents. And she said to me, she's a very bright woman, and she had a complicated life and complicated relationship with her husband. Great love, but also a lot of complications. She had a lot of the explosions that we talked about at different times, the post-traumatic uh, uh, features. And she said to me this week, I don't understand. Why do I have guilt all the time about everything, about things that don't make sense? I swim in the swimming pool in my development, and I feel guilty because my daughter is working so hard. I buy myself something nice, and I feel guilty why do I get to buy it and, I don't know, someone else doesn't? She said to me, forgive me, but she said to me, you know, even when I had sex with my husband, I would feel guilty why I'm having such a good time. And he would say to me right away, who were you thinking about? What were you feeling bad about? Because he could sense that. Why would someone... Now, this, for her, was a very strange 
and random collection of things to feel guilty about that don't make sense. And when it doesn't make sense to us, when we have a lot of things like that that seem like an unrelated collection of weird responses, it makes us feel very fragmented, very unclear about what's actually going on inside us and all of that. And it's very helpful sometimes to be able to actually uh, see it in a very clear frame of reference because then we can go, aha, ah, so it's all related and I can understand why I had this, I, I came to feel this way, and then maybe I can see, is it still necessary, is it not, can I do something about it? In this particular case, the frame of reference was me telling her that there is a lot of sense behind these various aspects of feeling guilty about good things that you uh, experience. Because, for example, as a child of survivor, and, and certainly as many survivors. You know, the concept of survivor guilt is a very, is one I use very carefully. Because first of all, of course it doesn't mean that anybody did anything wrong. They just feel guilty sometimes, not because they did something wrong, but simply because they survived when other people that they loved so much did not survive. So there's that sense of, of guilt for just for having been the lucky one, especially sometimes with feelings that other people who didn't survive were better, were more charitable, were more deserving of it, uh, and why did I uh, survive? So it comes like that. That's in the survivors. In the children of survivors, what we see is guilt because the parents suffered so much. It's guilt because of knowing that the parents suffered through inconceivable things, but it's also <coughs> guilt through experiencing in the relationship with the parents, the parents' unspoken pain, and sometimes spoken pain. Yes, and sometimes obvious explosions that show the tremendous you know, pain, anxiety, distress, and that seeps in and becomes existential guilt. If my parent is feeling so sad, how can I, as a loyal child, allow myself to be carefree and completely happy? It seems disloyal. If I care about somebody and they're so sad, I should be sad with them. At least a little bit, right? So it's a little bit, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, in Passover, when we take the wine out of the cup, it's a very similar idea, psychologically speaking, and, and, and uh, really philosophically, right? But, of course, from my perspective, what's interesting is the, the psychological aspect of it, that you're supposed to have a glass of wine and enjoy it and celebrate something, right? But we take something off of it. We take something off of it for the suffering of our enemies, not to mention how much do we need to take off of our joy for the suffering of our loved ones. Yeah? So that's the concept of existential guilt in children of survivors. Now, in order to be happy, very happy in your life, in order to be fully present and available, to be intimate and to weave a full sense of intimate and joyful connection with your spouse, you need to be able to turn away a little bit from your parents and to certainly turn away a little bit from their sadness. Because what happens if you don't is that as your joy comes up, your guilt comes up. How can I be so joyful? How can I be so connected here when, you know, I'm supposed to be loyal to this person who's sad? Who has not felt that feeling in their lives here as second generation? I don't see too many hands up. So I'm talking about something a little bit familiar to people, right? Now, sexuality is... Uh, sexuality in the sense of uh, that I'm trying to talk about, which is not just that act which we have to do in order to procreate, 
but sexuality as a way of expressing connection and as a, as a way of feeling at one with somebody, and joyfully so, requires a certain capacity to really be fully present, fully present and fully capable to connect. And that is to go back to your question, which started me on this, is the reason why I'm talking about it in a group for children of survivors, because it is time, it is time in our life to be able to bring our adult selves, our mature selves, our wisdom, our life experience, our capacity to, you know, studies about development in life in general show that there are certain trends that go with age. One of the trends that is typical for people around this age is they begin to be able to see, to be able to see multiple truths at the same time. A little bit less of a black and white kind of either or way of thinking that characterizes people at earlier ages. And with that kind of wisdom, as, 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 as those processes are now working for us, you know, we may not have the figure we had at 22, but we have some other things that are pretty good that compensate for some of it. With these things, we, my point is we can begin to look at some of these issues and grasp the joyful um, possibilities of connection that we may have not quite um, fulfilled to their full potential yet. And it's very, very important, you know, most of our parents are no longer here that, I have to tell you, for many people, that also is a huge difference in their capacity to finally actually turn into their own lives, their own marital relationship, and really sort of look at how to make this uh, the best, because our parents and their legacy were such a presence in our lives that for many of us, in various degrees, it did not allow people to fully turn into their own um, relationship. So, and for some it did. I'm not saying that it's a general thing, but that level of extreme loyalty to our parents, which characterizes the second generation, and the extreme need to be aware of their needs and sometimes put their needs ahead of ours more often than not, all of those things might have interfered for many people with their capacity to focus on their own lives, happiness, intimacy. That's why we're talking about it. That was a long-winded answer. So I said we need a cohesive sense of self in general. So if I have a problem between, you know, um, even such things as, uh, you know, what kind of a, what, how does a good daughter behave, how does a good wife behave, how do I uh, behave as an intelligent intellectual person and yet at the same time cook, as one of my students said, a Thanksgiving dinner for every uh, Friday night. You know, how do we put all of these things together? If it's not very easily put together, if it's a problem for us, we don't have enough cohesion, then it's very difficult in many aspects of life, also in sexuality. In particular, if our aspect of sexual, sensual and sexual self is a little bit removed from what feels more like, what's me? You know, each of us has some traits and some characteristics that they feel is the most me, right? When I say about me, I'm, this is me, there are certain traits that are the closest to the core of it, and certain traits that are a little bit further apart, and certain traits that are completely out there. For example, I'll give you a not nice example, but it's a good example for the point I'm making. How about a woman who was always very proud and knew herself as very honest, very truthful, very loyal, all of that. There was a problem, a crisis in the relationship with her husband that took quite a while. She tolerated it very bravely. She thought she was doing as well as she could. And all of a sudden, completely from left field, she uh, 
found herself having an infatuation with another man, a co-worker. She didn't act on it, but the mere fact that she could find herself feeling this way was so foreign from her sense of what she is and who she is, yes? That's a good example of aspects that you feel all of a sudden you find yourself acting or feeling or having aspects that are very foreign from the sense of self. If your sense of sexuality and what is associated with it is a bit foreign to the sense of who is me, I'm reliable, I'm this, I'm that, then we may have a problem in those uh, areas. Also, if we have more negatively toned versions of what is um, our sexuality, uh, what is our body like, uh, feelings about our body, I'm ugly today, actually not today, yesterday I met a couple, he's very handsome, he worked out, boy, he has arms like this. He says, I think my arms are too thin, and I think my buttocks are so small, and he feels so terrible about his body. He's a handsome guy, but it really does interfere with his capacity to be uh, happily sexual with his wife, who loves him, and says, I can tell that in the middle of having sex with him, his mind goes to... Uh, my, my buttocks are too small, she, her hands are on me and she must feel that it's not the right and it's not, she must not like it, she mu and it goes, it goes, it goes, and you know what happens when the man's head up here starts taking over during sex, you know, other things, other muscles don't work so well, so we have a problem. Okay. So, um, on the other hand, uh, people who have a shaky sense of self can do one of two things. Either they can avoid having sex because uh, they're, they're not feeling good enough about themselves, like I said, and they get anxious, and once they uh, are anxious because it didn't go so well or whatever, then now they're avoiding the thing even more. And, you know, I already talked with you last time, and I actually have a very specific piece today, if we'll get to it, about what to do when sex has become, when marriages have become asexual. Sex has become so anxiety-laden that people are avoiding it, so maybe we'll get to that. But uh, people can do one of two things, as I say, when their sense of self or, um, uh, is shaky. They can either avoid it, or they can actually rely on it too much as a way their main way of getting a sense of I'm attractive, I'm uh, loved, I'm wanted, and so on. And that can also become uh, a, bit, a bit of a problem if that's the main way of doing it at the cost of being uh, more attuned to the other person. Another thing that is very, very important, which gets better with age and gets better with intentional focus. And a lot of what we talked about in the previous meetings was about self-regulation and the capacity to actually look at your own responses, recognize that a lot of them are automatic responses, responses to things that trigger you, but that don't have to remain your only responses. If we look at that, if we see, okay, why did I explode here? Or why did I feel so bad there? Remember the example that I gave you about uh, Gabor Mate, the psychiatrist who said, I gave a great talk, they loved me, I felt so good when I left that lecture, and then I came to the plane going back home, they upgraded me to first class, I was so happy, I felt like a king. I got off the plane, my wife was supposed to pick me up, and she wasn't there. I call her, she's an artist, she forgot herself, she lost track of time. And he said, I felt so abandoned. I was so profoundly upset and hurt because he was a child survivor and he was abandoned by his parents, abandoned in order to save him. And he was saved because of that and they were not. But the sense of abandonment was triggered in him so powerfully. But if we have the capacity to then look at it, look at the times when we shut down, Look at the times when we explode. Look at the times when we feel something so powerful and it gets in the, into the relationship 
and we respond a certain way to our spouse, if we take the step back to look at it, we can actually examine those automatic responses. We can use our brain of today, not the brain of the little child when those patterns were established in us, but the brain that we have today to say, ah, I know why it happened. I was an abandoned child. My parents abandoned me to save me, but for the child that I was, all I could feel was they abandoned me. And that sense of abandonment still lives inside of me. And when my wife is supposed to pick me up from the airport and tell me that she forgot about me, I get this reaction, which is so much more potent than it ought to be because of that. Yes? If we can think about it, understand the context where that reaction arises from in our emotional history, in our emotional makeup, we can actually work to down-regulate it. We can actually remove ourselves a little bit from it and develop new patterns. And the beautiful thing about our brains, which has now been shown beyond doubt in hard data, it's not a clinical explanation, like we used to have until about 20 years ago. Now we can actually look at what happens in the brain and we can see that new patterns, you know, every time we do something different, like let's say he used to respond with a sense of abandonment to all kinds of little things when people didn't do or were, were not there. Each time we actually intentionally come up with a slightly different response, the neural circuits in our brains wire to this new thing and actually change. So functional and structural elements in our brain actually change. And the more we do something different than we used to, the deeper those connections become and the weaker the older connections are. So... Whatever we manage to do now differently every day builds a different connection in our brain and allows us to literally move away from patterns that were very problematic. But it requires intentional attention. So another thing that can really interfere with people's in, uh, sexual intimacy is what, what I call there are pre-conscious organizing principles about uh, sexuality or in other normal words, attitudes about sexuality, our conscious and semi-conscious attitudes about sexuality. So I gave some, you know, stereotypical things, depending on our previous experience in, at home, in our, uh, with our peers, with our immediate uh, culture, uh, expectations such as sexuality is dirty or sexuality is dangerous or sex is something men like but women tolerate, Sex is a means to, uh, she uses to get what she wants from me. Or sex is one of the best ways to feel close. Sex is the best way to feel potent or masculine. Or sex makes me feel young still. Depending on those attitudes that we have about sex, those can be either helpful or not so helpful uh, for us in sex. Other things that are less perhaps uh, uh, obvious to us is that we each have an implicit or what we call procedural knowledge. Procedural knowledge in psychology means things that we do, we just learned how to do those things, and they become second nature to us, like riding a bike, like the way that we cut, I don't know, um, vegetables, like you know, things that we just learn to do them that way, and that's how we do them. In, in actuality. So in sexuality, it includes a lot of nonverbal, automatic, or kinesthetic, meaning how we move the body and how we use our body, kinesthetic knowledge about things such as how close to get, how restrained or unrestrained to be uh, in the uh, sexual uh, 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 relationships, how or whether to recognize and to communicate 
uh, one's sexual needs and so on. So, for example, someone said to me the other day, you know, I mean, the, the, I actually gave it to you in the very beginning, in the first part, the thing about um, one of the complaints is uh, uh, that he or she touches too much this way or too little this way, too uh, aggressively or too lightly or too... All of those things, those are kinesthetic ways. And we learn them from the way that we were touched even as babies and children. And there are families, right? Uh, that's something that actually someone just said to me yesterday also, a couple said, in his family, there's no touching. No touching. And when we meet, you know, there's a maximum, there's a handshake, a handshake. You know, in my family, she said, you know, everybody piles on top of the other. She said, I can sit on my parents, on my father's lap. This is a 36-year-old physician. So I can sit on my father's lap. There's nothing to it. Everybody hugs. Everybody touches. So we're not only talking about sexual touch. We're talking about this kinesthetic knowledge that we get from the family where we grew up is to touch in general, and sensuality and closeness in general. People can have very different ideas about it, and certainly people can have very different ideas about the fact that one can even talk about it. What? You can tell your husband um, that you don't like the exact way that he touches your whatever, I'm going to leave, leave it blank. Is that? And how many women say, I try to tell him that I like it better when he goes a little slower or when he touches a little bit differently and he gets really upset because, you know, a lot of people get very defensive when anything is said to them about their sexual behavior. We are very, very vulnerable to it. So the idea that we can actually talk about it and that we can talk about it in a nice way and that it can be, as I said to you in, a, in the previous part, and I might even get back to it today, that sexuality at this age is not the sexuality of 15-year-olds or 19-year-olds or 22-year-olds. It's very different. And it's not about just this unbelievable excitement of discovering a new thing and how... Uh, how, how, how to, uh, as fast as possible, get to um, uh, a release of the tension. It's about consciously thinking, this is what I want to do right now in order to be very close to my spouse. And I want to do this as slowly as need be. I want to learn what makes my spouse get from her, in her own way, or in his own way, what makes them feel the best, sensually, emotionally, physiologically, sexually. This is what my goal is at this moment. So, as I said, the context, what we learn in the past is very, very um, important and, and determines a lot, but it's time to open our minds to some other new ideas that might be fresh and might be helpful for this point in uh, this time in our life. Um, and that's where I said down here, as you can see, highlighted in red, uh, even though our past determines these attitudes that we have, it also, these attitudes and our brain, where they are represented in neural circuits, changes all the time when we do and have new experiences, which means that we also can very much change all the time. So I wanted to uh, summarize, uh, I think, five points I put there that are really important to me. They build on a lot of stuff that we talked about in the other meetings that were more about enhancing the closeness in the relationship. But now I'm tying it down specifically to sexuality. But they're still the same ideas. So how do we improve, potentially, our sexual connection at this point. I, uh, the first point that I put is I want all of you to think about focusing on accessing and heightening more vulnerable affect. What does it mean? So 
It's very easy for us when we're upset about the other person's behavior, when we don't like the fact that, uh, you know, here, here is an example. Uh, a couple in their mid-30s, she went to Israel for her father's funeral. He stayed and took care of the young kids. And when she came back home, you know, the flights from Israel often land very early in the morning. So he was home with the children. It was 7 o'clock or so when she got home. And she got right into bed. And she wanted to snuggle with him. And she wanted him to hug her. She was very sad. She came back from the funeral. And she wanted to be held and ask, how are you? How are you doing? And all that. He did not ask anything. He <coughs> hugged her and got very sexual and immediately had sex with her. This was not good. This did not go well at all. Because not that he was an uncaring man. He was a very caring man. His attitudes and his, uh, all of those things that I talked about were that the best way to reconnect with her and um, show her how much he loves her, how much he's one with her, how much he wants to comfort her was sexual. That was his language of love. And for her, it was he's just using me. He was sexually deprived for two weeks. And all he wants is to, first of all, se have sex with me. And he doesn't care about how I feel. And he's not really there for me. So these were very, very different languages of love. Yes, that show very clearly the stuff we talk about. Now, what we all do when we're upset is we blame, we say, you, do, you don't care about me, you just wanted sex, you didn't want to hear how I'm feeling, blah, 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 and so forth. When what we really need to do is we need to develop the capacity, which in my opinion is very much tied to a lot of courage. We need to develop the courage to actually say to the other person, not why we're angry with them, but what it was that we are wishing for, what it was that we long for, what it is that we yearn for from them. That's what I mean when I say uh, heightening vulnerable affect. When we're angry, when this girl said to him, you don't care about me, all you wanted is sex, she was angry with him and she was blaming him for misbehavior when in fact what she wanted to say is I was so hurt because I so want to feel you um, interested in me. I so want to feel close to you. I want to feel that you care about how I feel. That's what she wanted to say. But we all make that mistake that when we are hurt we express it as an angry, blaming comment as opposed to having the courage, the guts that it takes to say what we actually really yearn for and long for and want from the other person. And if we say that part, which is so much more vulnerable, there is a much better chance that we will actually get a response that is also... Um, more vulnerable, more likely to give us maybe what we want. When we say something blaming and angry, the chances that we'll get a similar reaction are much, much greater. Let me just say, just to make sure that I'm not misconstrued, yes, not the woman, all of us. So he could say, wow, I'm so, he could say angrily, I just want, you know, whatever, I, I thought, uh, yeah, he, could, he could be angry back, right? Or he could say, I'm so sorry, I missed you so much, and I so wanted to connect with you and to show you that I'm here for you, and I so wanted you to feel that I'm here for you, yes? Or something like that, which would be so much more likely to get her to see where he was coming from than if he said something defensive, like, uh, uh, what do you mean I don't care about you? I stayed here, I took care of the children, I allowed you to go to that, da, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what I mean by uh, heightening and accessing 
with great courage, really developing our own courage when we are hurt, when we are upset, to not say angrily, reproachingly, uh, you know, what we're upset about in the other person, but actually what we were hoping for, what we are longing for, what we want from them, which also gives them a very much different place to be. It gives them the place of someone who has something to offer, who we want this from them, and then they can give it to us. If we're just standing there angry and telling them what they did wrong, they can be very confused about, so what do they do now? Okay. The other thing uh, is the, uh, uh, to pay close attention. You know, in relationships, there, is, there are cycles of what we call uh, rupture and repair sequences. And if you will think back <coughs> to the video that I showed you about <coughs> mothers and infants, that was a lot of that uh, was to be seen there. Because what do we mean when the mother and baby, uh, when we look at mothers and infants in that way, in that technique with the videos, you can see when you cut it every second, you, the two of them, we have the camera on both of them, right, and we cut it every second, you can see that in pairs that are very problematic, like mothers that are <coughs> depressed and they have a really hard time interacting well with their children and a lot of problems uh, start, and in couples, dyads, pairs of mothers and infants that are very good, in both of them, there is about the same percent of times when the interaction is not well matched. So the baby wants to take a moment kind of to themselves, and mom doesn't pay attention, and it's like, a, hey, kutsi, 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 or something, a little bit. Yeah, not too terribly intrusive, but mismatch or the baby wants mommy to pay attention and mommy is still another couple of minutes on her cell phone or some there are a lot of mismatched uh, uh, moments like that about 30 percent of all interactions in the good pairs and in the not so good pairs it's about 30 percent so what's the difference the difference is in the sequence of uh, rupture and repair Meaning, in the bad uh, um, dyads, somebody is not in the right place that the other person wanted them, and a very bad sequence starts. They can't fix it. You know, there is a beautiful caricature that I actually put in a, in a different uh, context for a workshop that I'm giving Thursday. So it goes like that. There's a mother and a child. And the, the child says, I'm depressed, and I'm not, uh, I'm not good enough, and I'm not that. And, uh, and then he says in the next one, I'm this, and I'm that, and uh, something bad. And in the third one, mom has listened and has not been able to make it feel better, right? He's going on and on. In the third one, mom says, you know, it's not so terrible. A lot of people feel this way sometimes. So in the fourth uh, piece, it goes, what? So you mean I'm not special? Oh my God. Oh, da, da, da. So it's like, that's a good example of a dyad that cannot repair the bad or the negative affect. The child is feeling bad. First, she's trying to listen to him and be patient and give him a good one. No, that doesn't change it. He still has the negative affect. Then she tries to say something encouraging and whatnot. That still doesn't make it better. In fact, it makes it even worse. That's what I mean by uh, sequences of rupture and repair that don't work well. It's like nothing you can do works. The other person gets even worse and worse negative affect. Those are the bad dyads. In a good dyad, the repair is much quicker. The negative affect, let's say, you know, um, my daughter today, here. I have a 19-year-old daughter. She's a very sweet girl most of the time, but you know, there's a certain time in the month when she's less nice by a lot. <laughs> so I spent some hours with her today. That was a very risky behavior. Also, so today I, was, uh, I made the decision, which was a pretty risky decision. I spent a few hours with her. And at some point, what was it? I said something really innocuous or whatever. And she answered me in this really nasty 
tone that those days uh, characterizes uh, more frequently her responses. And if I were in a bad day, I could have answered in a very nasty way. And let me assure you, that would have been a cycle that would have gone like this for hours, right? She'd be upset, I'd be upset. She'd storm out of the car on the way to the store, I'd storm out, right? We could have had that kind of a dance. But I wasn't in a bad day, and so I just said very calmly, you know, you really need to be careful about your tone because it's unacceptable to me that every time you won't like something, oh, her father said something on the phone. That's what did it. Said that every time somebody says something you don't like, you will use that tone to us. And with that was the end. She took a second. She said, I'm sorry. We were back to fine. We had a nice, a nice time. Now, that's an example of negative affect is there. It can go bad, or the pair has a way of repairing it much quicker. That's the difference between good pairs, whether it's husband and wife, mother and daughter, whoever it is. It's not how many times it's mismatched, or you annoy, I mean, I annoy her all the time. She's 19 years old. I mean, you know, she annoys me also a good chunk of the time because she's 19 years old. The question is not how many times we annoy each other. The question is how fast it gets repaired. So in a couple, you have to pay attention very much when things go bad, when there is a tone, when there is a facial expression. It's not just the words, but when you see your spouse having a facial expression or a tone that indicates that something went wrong here, you can do what I would have done on a bad day, right? You can say, what are you making a face again, right? Or whatever. Or you can actually address it in a nice way and say, what, what just happened here? Or is anything wrong? But not in a fearful way, but just a, with an interest, with a curiosity as to what happened. And sometimes it's just about setting a limit, like I did today with my daughter, right? Like, hey, that's not okay, right? But without hostility, without getting back at the other person with your own hostility, with your own annoyance, just, hey, you know, I noticed it. There are many ways in which we can repair, pay attention to the rupture, the facial expression, the tone, whatever was said, Pay attention to it and address it right there and then in a non-hostile way with the intent in your mind being, okay, something went wrong here, let's see how we can repair it as, so, as fast as possible, not how can I get back at them or show them that I'm annoyed or uh, let them know that I'm the man here or let him know that I'm not his doormat here or whatever, but really how do we repair it? Question, how do you repair it in a situation with survivor parents where whatever you say is not good? So, as I said, right now, today, my slant was to the couple relationship. It is not the same with our survivor parents. With the survivor parents, as someone before addressed me also and said, you know, I try so hard, I do, but nothing is good, and you know, uh, even my child survivor, the 80-year-old that I mentioned, she said, you know, she said to me today, she's so uh, honest with herself. She said, look at me. I'm fine. I'm still physically well. I have money to do what I want. The children are good. But nobody needs me anymore. And you know what? If, as far as I'm concerned, if I went to sleep and didn't get up tomorrow morning, I would say thank you to God. But I know that it's sinful that I'm even thinking that because look at me, everything is good. There's so many people that would like to switch places with me. Why am I so negative? Yeah? And that is a fact. I can show you studies. I can show you the statistics. I just gave a talk about the child survivors because right now our main focus is still on the child survivors with regards to survivors because the older ones are barely around anymore. So we're trying to uh, train the people who work with the child survivors how to deal with them, their children or caretakers or health caretakers. This, 
the statistics are clear that their sense of well-being in life is less good than other people. And that they, despite good achievements, good families, despite other things being equally successful, their subjective sense of well-being is less good. And we see it in many other populations that are trauma exposed, that the capacity to, not in all, again, nothing that I say applies to all. There are survivors who are incredibly um, vital and full of life and very uh, grateful and very appreciative of what they have and all of that. There is a lot in this population. There's m huge variability. But as a group, there is statistical evidence that is quite clear that they, many of them have a less good uh, sense of well-being than others, despite uh, no objective reasons for it. And with, if we are talking now about our parents, which is, like I said, not the focus of what I said now, because today was about couples primarily, with our parents the attitude is actually completely different, and I think I addressed it at some of the other meetings. With the survivor parents, we have to accept the limits of our capacity to change things that are beyond us. We have to be good children. We have to be loyal children. But we also have to recognize as middle-aged people that our need as young people, our need and our drive and our irrational sense that if we will only do it just right, then they'll be happy, or it will undo some of the horrible things that happened to them, or the impact of some of those horrible things on them. That was part of uh, a very understandable reaction of young people to parents who have been through terrible things. But it's not a realistic expectation. And now we are not children anymore, and we are not young people anymore. And we have to understand that children who grow up with parents who went through terrible things develop an inordinate sensitivity to the, the parents' needs, the parents' emotional needs, the parents' expectations. We feel that it is somehow our loyal responsibility to try and make them happier. And we go through all kinds of extreme, sometimes, uh, efforts to try and do that. At this point in life, we have to recognize, like many other things that we have to recognize now, with the adult mind that we have, that there are limits to our capacity. There is no way that some of us, some of you, can make that survivor happy. My survivor that I told you about, this woman, the 80-year-old, she knows it. She said it herself. She said, my children are good. They're good children. And she's very lucky. She has two daughters. They both live nearby. Everybody who can is in her house for Shabbat meal every week. One daughter comes from New York to New Jersey. The other one is in New Jersey. They come there. But the grandchildren are older now. Nobody needs me, she said. And they don't. They don't. And the question is, to which extent can we, and by the way, it's a wake-up call to us, because, hey, you know what? Within a certain not too long time, we will be at that age. To which extent does a well-adjusted individual adapt to this new place in life where nobody needs you. Your children, you've done a good job. Your children are capable adults. They're set in their own lives. They don't need you. Your grandchildren are already young adults in their 30s. They're busy. They have stuff. They love you. They come to you sometimes when they can. They're very... Uh, 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 dutiful, they will call you, but they don't need you. So how do you adjust to that? Do you have somehow other things 
to feed your sense of self-esteem with, to give you a sense of purpose, to give you a sense of meaning, other than that you are needed. But for our survivor parents, being needed was very, very important because it was one of the only and most powerful counterbalancing things to their guilt. They did not survive in order to enjoy life. They survived in order to make a family, in order to rebuild their family, in order to rebuild the Jewish people. They did not survive to have fun. Right? So all of a sudden, the children are grown, the grandchildren are grown. Nobody needs you. What are you doing now? Some of them, even when they were needed, they were not able to be happy. And they were uh, depressed, and they were irritable, and they, were, they had headaches, and they had other pains, and they had all kinds of things. And they fought with the only sister that survived, or with the only brother that survived with them. Someone just said to me this past week, I don't understand this. My father had one brother that survived with him, and then they didn't speak afterwards. For uh, How many stories like this do I know? A lot. A lot. So they, a lot of them had these problems all along, even when they were needed, but at least there was some structure and purpose to their life at that time. Now, there is none of that, and for many, those who, were, who had problems before, and even some who didn't have problems before because they were so driven and busy with all the things that they were doing, all of a sudden, it's catching up with them, and what do you do? So we can do the best we can. We can try to do the best we can. You know, my patient's children, they just took her to China. They, she went on a trip to China with them. She went on a cruise uh, just before that. So she's a very lovely woman. Someone else invited her for a few days, a relative through marriage, to California. And with all of that, she's saying... What am I here for? And so I'm just telling you that even in the best of cases like this, and she teaches Yiddish somewhere, and she volunteers something else, and she talks about the Holocaust, and she was honored in some di special dinner, hear about it and there, and with all of that, that's how she feels. What do you think I can say to her poor daughter, who says to me, ah, what, what, what should I do? I say, you have to be okay with yourself. You have to make peace with the limits of our ability. Those are some of the old uh, wounds. Those are the long-term effects of trauma when people age and they no longer have the distractions that they had before and they don't, no longer have the things that kept them, buoyed them, despite their wounds, those are now, this is how it looks, and you have to be, uh, you have to accept the reality of it, you have to be the good daughter according to your standards. And I often say to people, when we need to think about what's right, a good way to do it is tell me somebody else's story. Make it somebody else's story. Tell me about this friend of yours and her mother, and I make her tell me the story as if it's about somebody else. And tell me, what would you tell your friend? What do you think your friend should do as a good daughter? And with that she needs to make peace, that that's all she can do and nothing more. Uh, so that's what I mean. So if you're asking me about the parents, that's a completely different thing. But today, I was focusing on the couple with the assumption that we are all still completely uh, uh, able to change, to talk with each other, to, uh, to uh, adapt to new things in life. I don't expect that from my elderly survivors at this point. Yeah, there we just have to accept certain things and make sure that we ask ourselves what's the best way to be 
a good child according to my standards and get the approval and the uh, whatever from our own conscience. Lastly, I just want to quickly, uh, you know, I'm on slide 35 and the rest of them go all the way to 65. So I don't think we will manage to get to 65. However, in this meeting, however, I do want to mention that there is no shame at any time in life to also uh, acknowledge that one could benefit from educating, coaching, or specific suggestions about sexual behavior, especially because our sexual behavior changes around 50 for many physiological and hormonal uh, reasons. But even without any problem like that, sometimes it's really helpful to just get some specific uh, information. For example, uh, and, and I say, you know, it's very difficult for people to talk about sex. Sex is a very important aspect in marriage. We see it in any kind of study that we run on marital relationships, but it's very, very hard for people to talk about it. People are very sensitive, very vulnerable around it, and it's hard to talk about. But, for example, uh, when, I, when I talk about uh, education... Um, I wanted to tell you, for example, a very simple fact. Someone came to me just a little bit, uh, uh, a few, a, a couple of weeks ago, and they actually really thought, they really thought that most women can orgasm in, uh, in, in intercourse. And th this was not a young person. This was someone in like 45 years old or so. It's like, uh, it's really upsetting to him that his wife can't orgasm in intercourse. And it's a simple fact to just educate people that a very small fraction of women can orgasm in intercourse. It's just a fact. So having an expectation that is not uh, based on good sex education is a problem because he was giving his wife a bad feeling, he was himself feeling like he's not adequate, and so forth. Being mindful about sex uh, is, a, is a slide I want to stay on for a couple of minutes. It's really important to pay attention to what people are actually thinking, feeling, saying to themselves before and during and after a sexual encounter. So you really need to kind of stop and think about it within yourself. And maybe you may even find a nice way of asking your spouse what they uh, think about it. If they're worried about things such as, um, do I have a, a good enough erection? Will I have a good enough erection? Will I have to be able to sustain it? Will I not be able to sustain it? If they're doing that kind of uh, spectatoring, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? All of those uh, things are very, very uh, damaging, and we have to help people encourage, encourage them to notice it and to just leave it aside and say, it's not about that. It's about closeness. It's about enjoying the closeness. It's about enjoying the experience no matter where it goes. Because you know what? We're not 17 years old anymore, and that's not the point. The point is closeness. Now, let me quickly go to something that I really wanted to have a moment to talk about. As I said, a lot of marriages in the United States, in the general population, have become asexual marriages after... Uh, uh, having you know, any, any kind of long-term relationship or a marriage. There's a very high percent of them, and it's not at all easy to revitalize a marriage once it came to that place. I think I gave you a, a, maybe the example of this highly sophisticated, highly successful couple in their 50s that came to me. I mean, really intelligent, unbelievably sophisticated people. And they hadn't had sex in five or six years. I was like, five or six years? Okay, we have something to work on here. And, uh, and, I, and I said, and I started uh, asking very specific questions about how it goes. And I said, are you... Um, are you even like close in bed or when you go to bed, what do you do? Are you dressed? Are you not dressed? How close? She said, oh, it's a, it's a problem. There is a, in the mattress, there is a, like a hill in the middle by now. They were pretty heavy people, you know, I mean, uh, chunky. So they're like, there's a, we can't really come close to each other because there is a thing in the mattress. I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> 
get a new mattress. So they got a new mattress, but then the dog was in between. I was like, get the dog out of the bedroom. <laughs> so it's very difficult to revitalize a marriage once it's become asexual, because people become very self-conscious about it all of a sudden. Like, they, they, it's hard for them to believe that they actually can do that thing with each other again. So we have to start very slowly, very gradually, and the person who has the, what we call the low sexual desire, because it's usually the problem, I'm focusing right now on that, because most of the marriages where it happens, I'm not talking about the marriages where there is a real organic problem, like somebody had cancer treatment and they don't have the capacity. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about regular sexual people who can have a normal physiology and normal reaction, but they just don't feel like having sex with their wife anymore, or, or she doesn't feel like having sex with them anymore. That's what we call inhibited sexual desire issues. And the one who has the inhibited sexual desire has to be the one who's more motivated to do something about it. For example, the guy in that couple, he was much less motivated, uh, he was much less interested in sex than his wife. She wanted, he was like, he had all the excuses and whatnot. And I said to him in an individual session, I said, look, she is not willing to live like that anymore. Do you want the marriage to continue? Or do you not want the marriage to continue? Because she <coughs> was very clear with me. She said, either the marriage will not continue, or I'll stay married to him, we'll be great friends, we'll do everything together, but I'll have a, a separate apartment and a separate life in that way, or something. I'm not living like this for the rest of my life. So I said to him, what do you want? You have to do something about it if you want to keep her as your wife and as your sexual partner. You have to do something about it. So the one who's less interested has to be at least the one who's much more motivated to keep it going and to do something about it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And then, once there is the motivation on that person's part, because they recognize that they're making their spouse miserable, unhappy, that it's not fair, or, or out of their own self-interest that they recognize that maybe she'll leave me or he'll leave me. It's like my one patient said to me, I can't believe it. He said, I haven't had sex in four years. I'm a married man, and because I will never be unfaithful to my wife, I find myself abstinent because I'm married. All right? So... You have to somehow come to grips with the fact that that's not a sustainable situation and be willing to do something about it. Once you get to that point, we have to establish that the problem is not one person's. It's a couple team. It's a team effort. And the team has to work together and put in the time and the energy and make it possible. So um, one, of the, one of the things that, of course, is very important when I'm saying being mindful about sex, you know, uh, sex like in the movies or sex like when we were 20s is uh, no longer sex in this phase of life, except perhaps for people who are in a new relationship for some reason at this phase in life. But if we're in a long-term relationship, it's not like that anymore. We're not looking for spontaneity and crazy hot sex. We're looking for uh, a, a way in which we actually make it possible for it to happen, which means think about your schedule, think about your life, you know each other very well. Think, what would be the right time to, to reserve for that to maybe happen? for that to be possible for it to happen, yes? What's a good time of the day? She doesn't like the morning, he doesn't like the night. Okay, so here is a, a if the house is, is empty and the kids are not there anymore, maybe the afternoon is a good time. Or, you know, think uh, mindfully about when would be a good time, how would be a good time, what situation, get the dog out of the room, close the door, Get the phone out of the room so it doesn't uh, ring in the middle. All those little mindful things that create a space in which it can happen. And then enjoy the situation and the, the experience 
as it is no matter where it goes to. And here I would suggest my plan was to talk about a specific strategy that we call sensate focus which is uh, a way that we use with couples who have become asexual. They are so uncomfortable about thinking about having sex again that we go by stages. And in order to cut the anxiety down, we say for the first phase, and we decide with each couple how long that first say, phase will be, let's say two weeks. Two weeks, you will not do anything, anything with each other other than intentionally focus and increase affectionate touching in general. Like you walk by her in the kitchen, caress her back or caress her arm. She walks by you, touch him in a nice way, affectionate way, not sexual, not anything, just affectionate touch again to be introduced because people can come to a situation where they tell me, they barely touch each other anymore for God knows how long. So first of all, increase affection and touch. Nothing else. You commit to nothing else for that period. After that has been achieved successfully, we go to the next phase. We decide how long it will be, and we say, okay, now for the next two phases, you, for the next two weeks, let's say, you can do affectionate touching, and you add to it sensual, non-genital Pleasuring. So whatever it is, you know, uh, touching your hair, caressing your face, whatever it is that you like that is a sensually pleasing, pleasurable experience, but not more than that. The third phase is playful touch that does include genital and non-genital touch, but nothing more than that, just touch, just enjoyable touch. The fourth, the fourth phase includes other uh, uh, forms of stimulation, all the way, it can go all the way to, uh, co to orgasm. And the last phase, and the last phase, and only after all of these phases have been uh, practiced successfully, in the last phase we say, okay, now you can go home and you can actually have sex. You can do all of these things, and if they lead you to the point where you actually are ready to have sex, then go ahead and have sex. Uh, a, a very um, nice and not at all uh, problematic movie, I think, for you to watch would be the movie Hope Springs that describes a couple in their mid, middle age and, uh, and them going to a therapist who uses sensate focus and just the dynamics between them and it's Meryl Streep and what's his name? I forget his name all the time. And it's a really nice movie and you won't find, I think, something there that's too um, inappropriate for you to watch. So I would stop here and I would say for the last uh, five minutes, I would like to tell you that I really, really... Uh, valued this experience tremendously. I've come to really value my monthly uh, trips to Borough Park, uh, to, 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 the, to, to here. I really have become very um, sort of attached to this group. It's like, ah, my group and the faces. And uh, I really appreciate your uh, acceptance of me and my whatever I had to give. You were always so appreciative and so accepting and so open to it and so lovely to be with. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Question. What positive feelings can we take from this? I think the question is uh, somehow, uh, I would say, two, two parts of it. Uh, one is the, the fact that, first of all, with all of the stuff that today we kind of mentioned right now more the negative, but there was actually a meeting in which we addressed specifically also the resources and the resiliencies that were inherited by the second generation. So there were also a lot of good things that we got from these parents who... To begin with, just think about that. If anybody were to predict what would the second generation look like based on what the parents went through, we should have all been unbelievably dysfunctional and damaged. The World Health Organization 
looked at about 20,000, a total of about 20,000 people in various samples over like, I don't remember, 79 countries or 29 countries or whatever, to examine the impact of trauma on impairment and dysfunctionality. And the uh, results show that if a person had more than four trauma, what we consider trauma in the field of trauma, yes? If the person had more, of four, more than four in their lifetime, they are much more likely to be much more impaired and much more dysfunctional than other people. Our parents suffered more than four traumas a day for a duration of years. And the fact is that as a group, we are a highly functional and successful group. So these people were unbelievably resilient, and they also gave us a lot of resiliencies and a lot of good assets. We talked a little bit about it in that meeting that was dedicated to that. In addition to that, there's another question that you're raising, which is how do we take even from the bed something good, which is what we consider um, in the field of post-traumatic growth. And that is that actually the worse your post-traumatic symptoms are, they're correlated with, in many people, that it's correlated with what we consider positive growth. People sometimes say, because it was so hard, it made me recognize even more what's important to me, what's important in life. It made me, you know, fight for justice or um, make sure that I rebuild the state of Israel or whatever. That's meaning that is driven by how hard the experience was and how just because it's so hard, we are driven to make meaning out of it, and that meaning actually becomes a very positive force in our lives, parallel to the post-traumatic symptoms which remain. Question. So to summarize the session, would someone with this background be more inhibited with intimacy? In various ways, uh, <clears throat> more inhibited or uh, actually uh, perhaps rely on certain behaviors more than, uh, than uh, uh, would be appropriate in the sense of less attunement to the other person. So it goes either way. You know, you can either be more avoidant of it and more inhibited, or you can rely on it excessively and to some exclusion of your attunement and sensitivity to the other person. It can be in many, many ways. And I just tried to touch upon a few things to highlight the main point, which was it's very important for us to recognize that trauma interferes directly with sexual intimacy. We see it in all kinds of trauma-exposed populations. It's not an indirect relationship. It's a direct relationship, and that we need to think about it. And whatever the issue is, we need the, you know, some of those uh, points that I mentioned about highlighting the vulnerable affect as opposed to blaming, being curious about why is my spouse having such a different attitude to it than mine, opening it up to, an, to a non-hostile, curious discussion enhances intimacy and can open the door to improvement in sexuality in a couple. Whichever ways it goes is not so much the issue, but what to do about it.